Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about molding and trim. We'd like to thank Lynn Myers for liking and sharing the podcast. The ancient Greeks used wood molding to beautify their homes and their buildings inside and out, Hmm. and they had a lot of rules for where it should be placed. They used trim to break up walls and columns into visually pleasing sections, and then sometimes they would paint these sections with different colors. Hmm. They, They had the golden rectangle, which was used for buildings and temples, so whether it was either horizontal or vertically, they had this shape that they thought was the most visually pleasing. Right. And then the golden triangle was used by the ancient Egyptians to construct the great pyramids of Giza. Hmm. Trim is the term for decorative pieces used to make transitions between floors, walls, ceilings, doors, windows, cabinets. So this is the overall like general term. Right. And then when you get into molding, generally this is trim with a curved shape, so it's Mm -hmm. more decorative. And pretty. Right. (laughs) And then the most common trim is baseboard and casing in most people's homes. Mm -hmm. Baseboards you're using to cover the gap between the floor and the wall. And this is going to also... the base. Right. And it's going to make a a barrier for dirt, bugs, pests. Mm -hmm. And it also protects your wall against, you know, if you're using your vacuum or a broom. It's usually going to be darker color to give an accent to the walls. And one thing you can do, if you move into a house and your baseboards are really terrible looking and you remove them and the wall is really messed up, or let's say you have plaster walls and it looks like there's a lot of repair to be done, and as you pull them up, you've kind of messed up the wall, you can just go a little bit taller and just cover all that up and forget (laughs) about it. So and, baseboards come in different sizes. Right. So two to eight inches is probably the most common. And Two to eight? Two like to eight inches, yeah, wide? yeah, sure. For if you have tall ceilings, it gives it more dramatic effect. Wow. It actually gives it just like the ancient Greeks; they had this formula. Depending on how tall your your so ceilings if you're are, looking for the golden tr- rectangle. Right, right exactly. <laughs> so your trim would be wider uh, based on how tall the ceiling is. And then with the baseboard, you can either use one piece or it can be decorative, uh-huh. or you can use multiple pieces like a baseboard and then on the bottom quarter round. Right. So you've got two pieces of wood. Casings are used around windows and doors, usually two to three inches wide. And but you can get this in a variety of shapes and sizes, right? Yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of it is going to be based, again, on your baseboard. So a lot of homes, if they have a four-inch baseboard, they're going to use a two-inch casing, so it's huh. visually appealing. And then you're going to have casings outside and inside. Crown molding is a transition between the wall and the ceiling, and this gives an architectural look to your room. Right. So crown molding is generally mounted at a 45 to the wall. So the bottom of this molding is attached to the wall. It comes up at a 45 degree angle where it meets the ceiling, and so there's going to be the space behind the molding as it, as, as it angles up. So it's sitting at a 45 where the bottom of that piece of molding is. Uh-huh. It's going up at a 45 degree angle away from the wall. So it's coming from the wall up away from the wall at a 45 degree angle. So it's kind of looking down at you. So you've got that profile and then there's a space behind it. So it makes it a little more interesting to put up. It's usually (laughs) usually a two man job. And this is going to cover up bad plaster work in older homes up at the ceiling where it meets the the wall. Mm -hmm. And this really gives a nice look to, again, large rooms or tall right. ceilings. Mm-hmm. And, and depending on the style of your home, too, it really matches some of the older styles. It's usually painted the same color as the ceiling, so again, it's accenting the wall. And it can be one piece of molding, or it can be built up with other trim for even a more dramatic look. I've seen some that are multiple pieces that really look thick and chunky. Mm-hmm. Chunky? Yes. How'd your molding look? <laughs> chunky. <laughs> That's a, that's a technical term. <laughs> Chair rail is this two or three inch wide molding that runs across the room. So it's horizontally across the room, up from the floor, about 28 to 32 inches. So like and, in the middle of the wall? Right. Well, up like a th- like about a, a third. Again, the ancient Greeks, they had this idea. They were the first ones to kind of come up with this. So they would, about a third of the room up, they would break it off. Hmm. And they found that to be visually pleasing, sometimes painting it Are a different color. Are we back color. to the golden rectangle? Yes, exactly. Hmm. And then in older homes, you're going to find them about 24 inches up from the floor if you have an 8-foot ceiling. Why is it a- called chair rail? 
you know, there's a lot of different stories on the history of this, and you know, the original the original Greek elements were just a visual thing. Right. But then uh, a lot of homes used that, and they found that it kept the chairs from bumping into <laughs> the walls. Early colonists were taking this trim and adding pegs to it, and then they would hang their chairs on this hmm. so that they could sweep and mop. Really? So it was truly a rail for That's their chairs. Nice. Do you think you talk you, about colonist more or ancient Egypt? I try to equally talk <laughs> about both. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll combine chair rail with wainscoting. So when I was on a few of these forums, it is amazing the arguments people get into about the pronunciation of wainscoat. So Why? I went to the dictionary, and it can either be wainscoat, wainscot, or wainscot. Huh. So to settle the dispute right here. <laughs> and this wainscot, what this is, is paneling that runs the length of the walls from the floor up to about three feet or mm -hmm. four feet, depending on the design, usually capped with a chair rail. And that, again, gives protection, and it gives that other, you know, dimensional look, especially with taller ceilings. Right. It gives kind of an interesting look. It's really a pain to take off, though. Especially like if they've used construction <laughs> adhesive. <laughs> With these wainscot wall panels, you can have vertical pieces of trim to hide the joints between the sections, which are evenly spaced, mm -hmm. and that's called board and batten. Hmm. Picture rail is another decorative detail for especially historic homes. So this is trim across the top part of the wall, sometimes seven feet up or higher. And this is where they used to, the old colonists, mm -hmm. they used to hang their pictures from. So rather than trying to put nails or hooks into the wall, especially these older homes with plaster and lath, which sometimes it would it would really damage the wall, right. they would hang a length of trim, so it's visually interesting, all the way around the walls, and then they would put little hooks or nails in that, and then they would hang their decor or their pictures off of wire. I don't from think I've that. ever seen this. Yeah, interesting, especially in I mean, New you England. I me pictures, but I don't think I've actually seen it like in yeah. real life. It's why, and now you see a lot of home centers. They're selling this specialized picture rail that the top is curved, and they have integrated hooks that you can buy, huh. and it hooks right onto it, and they slide around so you can you know uh, adjust your decorations wherever you want it. That's so it's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Plate rail is trim with a narrow shelf on top to hold plates and decorations, and this would be up high too. Huh. And then there's a variety of other moldings. So panel molding, like on a wall, you'll see small sections that almost look like frames. Right. So, you know, it can be rectangular or square. So like if you were thinking about a, a panel door. Right, exactly. Right, and so it would be going across the room in, in these panels spaced mm -hmm. evenly. You have all kinds of intricate detail on a lot of this molding, too. You can get dental. So this is small, evenly, dental? Yeah, small, evenly spaced blocks along the trim, so it looks like teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have egg and dart, so it's these oval egg shapes and V shapes. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, bead, pearl, so small spheres all along. The, so you should go online. It's pretty right. interesting, all of the different type of trim you can get. The reason why I wanted to do this episode is there's a lot of different types of molding and trim yeah, that you could yeah, use. Well. And you could add a lot of interest and character to each room of your house if you wanted to make them all different. Right, and it's pretty easy to do. And it's fairly cheap. Right. The most common material you're going to be using on trim is pine, oak, and MDF. And I hope you're going to explain that later. Yes. Pine... <laughs> Pine is easy to cut and sand, not expensive. It's going to take stain or paint. And you can get pine pre-primed. Mm -hmm. So if you plan on painting, it saves a step. Oak or any of the other hardwoods are great for a classic or traditional look. They take stain very well. You right. can either leave it in its natural color and just put a finish over the top of mm -hmm. it. Or you can stain it darker and then put a finish on it. And this is going to be your most expensive. Right. And because oak is so hard, it's going to be easy to use a router on if you want to create your own unique patterns on this. To make your own molding? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> MDF is medium density fiberboard, and this is a composite material. They take recycled wood fiber and glue, they heat it and press it into shape, so they're creating these pieces of trim. And it's popular because it's uniform, there's no knots, it comes pre-primed, mm -hmm. very easy to cut, inexpensive. 
The problem is it can absorb moisture and swell depending on where you're using it. Hmm. And when you cut MDF, it creates a lot of very fine dust. Mm -hmm. Some people have concerns about it because urea formaldehyde is used in many of the glues to help bind it to the wood fiber. Whenever you say formaldehyde, <laughs> that's not a good thing. So in the UK and the European Union, formaldehyde now is classified as a carcinogen. Hmm. And so that's one of the downsides See, of the I told you. M MDF. And a concern about wood dust in general, a recent study by the International Agency for Research on Cancer concluded that certain types of wood dust are carcinogenic. Hmm. So it's important that you're always cutting or sanding wood in a well-ventilated area. You want to wear a dust mask, minimum N95. Mm -hmm. If it has two straps with an adjustable nose piece, that's going to be the best because it's going to seal the best. Mm -hmm. I like an exhaust port if you're wearing glasses. It's going to keep them from fogging. Mm -hmm. And then if you're working with MDF, there's many of the woodworkers are saying get a dusk and organic vapor respirator mm -hmm. for the best protection. And wear goggles. Wood dust is an eye irritant. You can get polyurethane trim, which is less expensive than wood. It's rot and insect resistant. It cuts and paints very easily. And you can get foam trim. Wow. So this is very lightweight, inexpensive. And you, can, you seem very excited about it. Well, you it. can cut this with a utility knife. So if you don't no have way. a lot of tools around the uh -huh. house and you just need small sections And you just done, got a knife. <laughs> you can go to town. Very easy to paint. And then if you're using a saw blade, you'd want to use 60 teeth per inch or more and then you want to cut it quick. So if you're using a power saw with mm -hmm. foam molding, you want to cut through this fast because you can actually melt it if you, <laughs> if you, if you go too slow. And then you're just using construction, construction adhesive to hold it in place. Mm -hmm. And your seams, you can just glue together. Nice. So, so very easy if you just have a small project. Apparently, I guess you're going to be using that from now on, huh? With this foam trim, you want to use scarf joints if you're connecting two long pieces together. See, sometimes I think you're just making up words to see if I'm paying attention. <laughs> I should just throw that in once in a while. <laughs> so a scarf joint, because of the foam, it sometimes has kind of a ragged edge. Yeah, because you're using like a butter knife to cut it, right? <laughs> or scissors. <laughs> and a scarf joint, you're going to cut a 45 degree in each direction. You can use different angles, but let's say we're cutting two 45 degree, you're going to overlap this so that you don't see where it's butted together. Huh. And you're generally using adhesives mm -hmm. to, to glue them together. PVC trim is good for high moisture areas or outside. Mm -hmm. It's not going to warp or rot. And some communities actually restrict the amount of PVC trim you can use inside your home. Why? In case there's a fire, it oh. can create toxic fumes That's and, for the homeowners and for firefighters. Mm -hmm. You can join the sections together with a special glue. So a lot of this, if you're using PVC trim outside or on doors and windows, you're going to assemble this, do all your measurements, cut everything. You're going to dry fit it and then glue it all together. Then you're going to put it up as one unit. There is stain grade molding, and mm -hmm. this is solid lengths of wood. There's no knots or seams or any obvious blemishes. And they just need a clear coat to finish off the natural color, or you can be staining these and sealing them. Mm -hmm. These are the most expensive. They're usually hardwood. You also have paint grade molding, and this can be wood, MDF, or any of the synthetics. Mm -hmm. The wood is usually going to be a soft wood, and these long links are finger jointed together from smaller pieces of wood, huh. and so those joints wouldn't look good if you stained it. That would actually show up. <laughs> and much of this is going to be pre-primed, and right. it's less expensive. When you're installing baseboard and going to an inside corner, you've got a couple of ways you can do that. If you have baseboard that's going to be painted or you've painted it... Should you paint it, it first? Yeah, I would say do all your painting or staining first, and yeah. then it's easy just to touch it up right. once, it, once it's all installed. But on an inside corner, if you have painted baseboard, just cut both ends at a 45, tuck them together. If it's not a perfect seam, if there's a little bit of a gap, mm -hmm. you're just going to take painter's caulk, Put it in there, smooth it with your finger or a tool, oh, and, and then touch it up. It's going to yeah. be perfect. And the same with the top edge of painted baseboard. If it's a little wavy, if it doesn't stick to the wall perfectly, and right. there's some gaps, just run a tiny bead of caulk all the way along the top mm -hmm. and touch that up, and it's going to look perfect. Hmm. If you have wood that's going to be stained, now you can't use caulk to fix right. a, a gap. So what you're going to do is you're going to cope the corner. So you're going to have one long piece of trim that you cut flush and tucked into the corner. Mm -hmm. The other side, what you're going to do is you're going to use a coping saw and you're going to cut the shape of the molding right. out and it's going to tuck right over that and look perfect. We actually did a video on this. I was actually impressed with your skills. Thank you. With the coping saw. <laughs> 
So in that video, that was a very easy piece of molding. So what I did is hmm. I just used... So it had nothing to do with your skill. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have something that has a very simple shape, you can just line a little scrap piece of your molding up to your piece that you're going to cut. Mm -hmm. Take a pencil and draw that outline, and then just use a coping saw. And this is a very thin blade that you can maneuver very easily. Right. And it's actually a pull saw, so you're cutting on the pull stroke. Mm -hmm. And as you cut this away, you can even back cut it a little bit so you angle it a little bit towards the back of the molding right and as you cut that away it's very easy to put together mm -hmm. if you have a very complex piece of molding hire a professional <laughs> You're going to use a miter saw and you're going to cut the end of the trim at a 45 degree angle. And let's say we're looking at, let's say we have a power miter saw and you have your trim laying down at the end. You're going to tilt the top of your blade toward the long length of it and cut away. So as you look down now at this cut piece of molding, mm -hmm. you're going to see where the face is and then at that 45 degree angle, now you see the inside of the wood right. or whatever the material is. And so now you're just going to follow that outline that that 45 degree cut made. You're right. going to cut straight down with a coping saw and it gives you a guide. Huh. So very easy. You cut your 45 degree angle and now you have a guide to follow with your saw huh. and just cut that away and it's going to fit perfect. Whenever you're coping, it's nice to have a small file or a rasp and just work it. You're going to tuck it into a scrap piece and just keep filing it or sanding it. Right. And you're going to get a perfect fit. What grit do you use for that? I would say <laughs> <laughs> for the sandpaper, something fine like 120, well, of two, 220. The file, you'd want a small round one, so they call it a rat tail. Or you can use a Dremel tool with the small wheels, hmm. but again, they're a little more difficult to control in tiny corners. That's why those small round files do a very nice job. Hmm. For your outside corners, you're going to use 45 degree cuts on each piece to meet at the corner. If you have painted molding and there's a tiny gap, you can just use caulk and paint it. It's going uh -huh. to look great. For stained molding, though, you're going to have to get that cut perfect. So because it's usually more expensive, the hardwoods, I would take a couple scrap pieces and then cut your angles. Sometimes it's going to have to be 45 and a half or 46 degrees <laughs> to get a perfect, you know, no gap corner. Right. And you're just going to have to kind of test it until you find the perfect angle. And some rooms you're going to have corners with 135 degree angles or, or all these odd angles. Mm -hmm. So in that case, what you'll do is take two long pieces of molding and you're going to create a small transition piece and huh. you're going to meet those two links. In most cases, you're going to be nailing to the studs behind the drywall. So the studs are going, the center of each stud is going to be 16 inches away from the center of the next stud, except in corners or around doors. You're going to have it shorter or longer, double studs. With this, I would use a stud finder and a pencil to mark all the locations. Mm -hmm. The top rated stud finders are from Zircon. It's Z-I-R-C-O-N. We were getting and, pretty late in the podcast for you to start spelling. <laughs> and Franklin. <laughs> they both do a really nice job. If you're nailing this trim in by hand, you're going to use about an inch and a half finish nail. Mm -hmm. So it's either going to be an 8D or 6D. So it's 8 penny, 6 penny. You want to put this one near the top and one near the bottom. And you're going to nail this into the studs you're going to slightly point them down. It's going to hold it in place better. Mm -hmm. And as you're nailing it in, you want to stop short of the wood so you don't make dents with your hammer, and then use a nail set to finish driving it in just below the surface. Because you can't crack the wood. Yeah, and some people, depending on the wood, like if you have soft woods, then mm -hmm. I would just nail it. In most cases, nail it in. Unless you're very close to the edges, you can crack it. Mm -hmm. Then you, then I would say... Not that I've seen run, you do that or anything. <laughs> you can run pilot holes and, holes, and it might be smart. And that nail set is just this very narrow, thin tool that you're going to use a hammer with. It, it kind of grabs the top of the finishing nail, mm -hmm. and you're going to drive it into the wood and set it just below the surface. Right. And now you're not damaging the look of the wood. If you have paint trim you're just going to put a little piece of of caulk over that hole or putty and then paint it mm -hmm. and then if you have stained wood you're going to put then you can get matching wood putty right. that matches the color or you can use wood putty and then put a touch of stain over the top of that 
In many homes, your baseboard will have quarter round sitting on the floor to give a finished look to it. I don't you, like it. You can, <laughs> you can miter your outside corners and cope your inside corners for the best look. Mm -hmm. And if the quarter round is meeting the casing around the door and that's setting off the wall farther than the casing, you can cut a 30 degree angle and that's going to give it a softer look where they bump up next to each other. Right, so the casing is the trim around the door or window. Right. When you're putting your casing around a window or a door, the way you want to set your casing is give yourself a little bit of a reveal so you're showing a little bit of the jam. Mm -hmm. And a good way to pick that is on the side where the casing is going up against your hinge. See how far back that sets your casing. Okay. So it's usually going to be about 3 sixteenths of an inch or a quarter inch. Mm -hmm. And then take that same reveal so you're showing off the jam all the way around. You're going to get that measurement, and now you're going to put up the casing on top of the door first. Mm -hmm. You're going to use a power saw or a hand saw with a miter box. You're going to cut one side, and then you're going to measure so that you can get the exact um, distance on the other side right. of that trim for the top, and then you'll cut your miter on the other side. Mm -hmm. And a great tip, if you're using a power miter saw, if you make your mark where you want your final cut to be, mm -hmm. cut that just a little bit long and then make your cut and then slowly move your material up and make multiple cuts till you get a very precise cut because mm -hmm. we really want that reveal to be exact. And then when you put your top piece of the molding up, you want to pre-drill for four penny nails. You're going to use a 1 16th pilot hole. You don't want it too close to the end. You're going to now attach this. And I would just put a couple small finishing nails. Give yourself a little bit of distance from the end. So when you're putting your side casing, you can actually kind of push that up oh, a little bit. Smart. You don't want the nails too close. Mm -hmm. You want to measure the casing, how long it's going to be on the side, and then make your cut a little bit longer. Then you're going to cut your 45 onto this, turn your piece of casing upside down, and it's going to extend a little bit past it. You're going to set it right next to the first piece that we put above the door and use a pencil to mark it, and that's going to be our length. And again, it, you can kind of work towards your cut. If it's a little bit long, you can just kind of keep tapering it off mm -hmm. with your saw. Fancy. Many of the pros were suggesting use a little bit of wood glue along the edge, and when you nail them together, you want to wipe that off right away so right. that you don't leave any of that adhesive, and then put a nail straight down from the top, going through the top casing down into that side casing. Hmm. Wipe off any glue that comes out, and that's really going to give you a tight seam. Nice. But if you're painting all this, then just use painter's caulk <laughs> and just caulk everything all around it, and it's going to look perfect once mm -hmm. you paint it. If you're installing chair rail or plate rail, you can measure up from the floor your height, make a mark on both sides of the wall, mm -hmm. drive a nail on one side, and then snap a chalk line. Hmm. Or you can use a stud finder, mark each stud, and then mark a line with a level. And where the tra chair rail is meeting a casing, if the chair rail is thicker than the casing, you can cut that back at a 30 or 45 degree angle, and that's going to give you a better look. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about putting up crown molding, it comes from 3 to 20 inches in the height or the width. Wow. <laughs> so a lot of recommendations. If you have a ceiling height of 8 feet, mm -hmm. a 3-inch crown molding looks more symmetrical. Mm -hmm. 9 feet, 4 to 5 inches. Well, 9 feet to 11 feet, they suggest 4 to 5 inches. And then if you have 12-foot ceilings, they suggest 7-inch crown mold or taller. Wow. There's a variety of ways you can install your crown mold from just using the crown mold itself and nailing off the wall into studs and then nail it into the ceiling. Hmm. If you have walls or ceilings that aren't smooth, you can take molding and put it the whole length of the wall and the ceiling and you're going to create this smooth, uniform surface to nail to and it's going to build it up, make it look thicker. So what do you mean, like another piece of wood behind it? Yeah, like trim. You can use one by or you can actually use molding. So like a so furring strip almost? You can use a furring strip or some people actually use detail mold molding that will extend past it oh. so you're giving more depth to it. Some people use quarter round or cove trim added to that hmm. so you've got this thick look and you should take a look online for some ideas because it's pretty amazing all the different the right. variety of looks you can get with this mm -hmm. so you're, you're building multiple pieces on this. When you're cutting your crown molding for inside and outside corners it can be very difficult 
because it's not designed to be set, setting flat. So it's right. designed to come up at this angle. And so there's a bunch of techniques you can use, like holding, holding it in the miter saw, building a little framework, turning it upside down, holding it at, at an angle. Mm -hmm. But the easiest that I've come across is a crown molding jig. And so it's going to hold your Are piece. Are you making of, something up? <laughs> So this is going to hold your piece in place. It's going to give you a very precise cut. It's going to eliminate movement hmm. and just makes the especially if you're doing a big project and you haven't done a lot of this before. Right. This jig is just it's inexpensive and it's going to create a very professional final look. Hmm. And the three top rated jigs, one is from General Tools and this comes with a protractor. You've got Craig, K R E G and Bench Dog. And then if you're doing a lot of molding... What is a jig? A jig, so it's, so it's just something that's going to hold your piece in place. So it's, it's locking in... So a, like a and, vice? Well, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's something that you're setting your trim into, mm -hmm. and it's holding the exact position for you as you cut it. So it's holding the shape so as like you cut exactly it. So exactly like a vice. It, yeah, okay, exactly. There you go. All right, buy a vice. <laughs> and then if you're looking for uh, cutting like difficult corners for inside and outside corners, Empire has a protractor angle finder. Very inexpensive, and it helps guide you with those angles. Hmm. Do you have anything else to add? Because I am wiped out. I would... <laughs> I would say you should kind of do a layout before you start so you have a feel for what you need. Like when we talked about gutters, it's nice right. to kind of have a visual. And the tools you'll need, you're going to need a hammer, a nail set, a stud finder. If you're doing crown... Some saws, maybe a knife. Absolutely, yeah, miter saw. <laughs> and, and again, whether it's hand or power, mm -hmm. uh, a tape measure, a thin pry bar, a coping saw, a drill... You're going to need a small file if you're doing any coping. And if you're doing crown mold, you're going to need a helper and a ladder because it's difficult to put that <laughs> up yourself. Probably a caulk gun if you're doing painted stuff, a caulk gun, wood glue, wood putty. So it's nice to just lay it all out. Yeah, make a good list. And, yeah, <laughs> and then see what you have at home and whether you plan on finishing this job or not. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, and the Google Play Music app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our book, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Deep, 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 deep,